um, towards health that understand that there's a need of a collaborative process between uh, many disciplines uh, working from local to global levels. Uh, and this also recognizes uh, the importance of interconnections between uh, people, animals, plants, and of course the whole environment. So maybe this is a huge uh, difference uh, from the conventional way of understanding health because it really takes care about um, connections and systems. And what that one of the most important concepts in, 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 I think that not only in one health, but also in permaculture and many contemporary or like third generation uh, epistemological frameworks. So I don't know if you are related with the concepts of systems um, and, or, or if you're not related with systems, I would like to hear uh, what do you think that uh, a system means? I'm going to take this moment and um, uh, ask Christian, would you be able to sit down and be a little stiller because more still? Because what happens is you have this um, delay okay. on the video. I know you're an active speaker. This might be hard for you. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I would like to hear what what uh, our systems for you. You didn't know it was going to be a test, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? There's no wrong answer, guys. <laughs> um, I guess. It depends on the fields, but a general answer would be like different parts working together. Mm -hmm. As a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I think of agricultural uh, systems or like nutritional systems, um, I think about fairness across the, the whole chain, that like the whole, across all the areas so the farmers the animals the soil um you know the people selling the food um yeah and, really, really like fairness across all of them and if i've asked you uh, what's the result of one plus one what would you answer sorry what was that if you, if, what, what's the result of plus one plus one? Two. Two, are you sure? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plus plus one is actually three when we talk about system ah. because we can understand just the parts. So yeah, we have one part, uh, two parts and then what happens when this becomes together is like a third element so the interaction itself it's also pretty important to not just uh, like realizing the, uh, realizing that it exists uh, exactly the whole is more than the sum of parts but still we cannot understand the whole by the sums of its parts so that's the importance of systems and there's like three um, main things that we need to take care about when we talk about systems. So first are the elements, uh, second is the interactions, and the third one is the structure. So when we think about a pile of bricks, uh, some uh, iron, uh, some uh, uh, mortar, uh, cement, water, what do you think that we are talking about? Just a pile of materials, like building materials. Yeah. Yeah, there was a pile of building materials. 
But what else? What do you think that's going to become? A structure. Sorry? A structure. Mm -hmm. What else? A wall, of course. It could be a pool. It could become many things, right? So when we talk, we, when we think about the bricks, the iron, uh, those are the elements of the system that we can arrange them in many ways. So the interactions that happens between them is the thing that is going to have the structure that is going to create the structure of the system. So if we understand this process, then that's like the first uh, step or like the first door to understanding uh, not just one health, but many of these uh, uh, complex ways of understanding reality or holistic approaches. Uh, system theory were created more or less uh, at the ends of the 60s as a, a epistemological framework uh, because how we understand things comes from modernity and modernity tries to like separate apart and, and like a studying every tiny part of the whole. In this way, they think that they are going to understand the whole. Uh, and yeah, we have some other things as uh, an, um, an, a pretty um, limited way of understanding also interactions. And we can see this when we talk about action and reaction, and it's not just about that. And so there have been many um, uh, processes. So that led these critiques um, led to create the system theory. But then of course that system theories also have some uh, critiques. And one of the main ones is that it understands the whole and, and not also the contradictions of the system. And that's when complex thinking comes in. Uh, that's Edgar Morins is one of the uh, main uh, um, uh, authors in that um, uh, field. But the complex thinking, what it says is that yes and no can happen at the same time in the system. So it will depend. So every tiny interaction must be analyzed in order to understand that. So this brings a whole uh, discussion about uh, what is health, you know? So, so how, have we, how have we been understanding health from our contemporary societies and mostly Western societies? Um, and I think that we can see that in the pharmaceutical business, for example, uh, it's, a, it's like a whole understanding that we are ill, so we need to take medicine, and that's it. Uh, and there's like a direct reaction or a direct relationship between medicine and that we are understanding. And we can like build the better, the best hospitals. We can have have like a lot of high tech um, uh, gadgets. We can have like this amazing pill that is going to give you all the nutrients that you need for one day, so we can have all of that. But this is just understanding that small interaction. Because when we really uh, talk about health, we need to think about um, politics that are related with that. So why are we understanding health this way? What are the legal frameworks uh, that are supporting this way of understanding health and deliver health? Uh, and, and even architecture, uh, I, for me, was pretty amazing to uh, hear um, this uh, syndrome about the sick house. Uh, when this P a person goes to the doctor and is like, oh, I'm like feeling allergic all the time. I have some problems with my lungs. And they start like giving different medicines. They start like to um, send them to the specialty. Uh, and this person never gets better. Um, and at the end of the day, the, pro the problem is that the house is just keeping too much humidity and it's created some kind of fungus that is going to create an allergic reaction. So as 
as you're always going to be living in that humid and dark place, you're always uh, going to be uh, uh, sick. So yeah, there have been like many theories that are also related with this. Um, so the specificities of each ecosystem are also going to be related with the kind of housing that we need. And also technology, what are the, the impacts of, for example, uh, 4G in, in, our, in our energy system? Uh, how is education also addressing health? What are we teaching our, in our schools? Uh, many of the schools are like, just, oh yeah, if you get health, if you get sick, you go to the doctor. And I think that this is also something that we have been uh, observing during the pandemic. It's like, oh, you are going to get COVID, so you are going to get these pills. Um, but no one talk, hey, we need to strengthen our immune system. You need to have a better diet. You need to consume probiotics. You need to do some exercise and get some hours of sunlight. So this understanding that the only way of, of attending or addressing health issues and is once that you're sick because sick people makes money to the system, uh, to the pharmaceuticals, to the healthcare and all of that. And of course that nutrition is totally related with how we understand health. So if we see or we start to understand in these connections between politics, uh, between geopolitics, Physics, with, with, between uh, high tech, even clothing. Uh, once, uh, one of the first time that I talked with the women uh, group that uh, um, are weaving uh, with natural dyes and natural cotton, organic cotton, for me was pretty uh, uh, surprising when they start sharing about how we are keeping contact with our clothing like all day. So what happened, we, we are in contact with chemicals, with our skin all day. What happened when we are uh, using basically plastic in our skin all day? So that is going to affect our health as well, as different as if we use just cotton. And, and yeah, when we have like any kind of um, uh, allergy or something, it's like, hey, you should be wearing just uh, cotton. Um, Lots of good stuff in the chat, you guys. Thanks for con your contributions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That, that's amazing. So yeah, definitely. It's, it's about the whole, it's about the, the air that we, that, that we breathe. And something that is lacking a lot in our health systems right now is the spiritual part of it, the, the energetic part of it. And someone could say, oh, this guy is talking about like, hippie weird stuff and, and like, oh yeah, we're, what, what, is, what, what is happening, you know? But the thing is that there's an energetic um, uh, energy uh, that it's around the systems and we can find it in, in forests, you know? How do they, how plants talk to each other uh, with pheromones that's chemical or with different um, networks that the mycelium or the mushrooms um, um, weave into the soil. They are all the time talking, sharing information, and that is happening in an energetic level. So since we as uh, animals that are humans, uh, we are also part of that. But the thing is that we have forgotten uh, this connection that it's uh, more than just, oh yeah, the tree is beautiful and I go into hog a tree every day. No, it happens even deeper. Um, and this is something that permaculture uh, try to address. Uh, so I, I get a little bit of uh, the things that you were saying in, in, during your introductions. Uh, and I heard a couple of times that, ah, yeah, I'm interested in per permaculture. So I would like to hear, uh, what do you think that is permaculture? If you will ever have heard that concept. I guess my basic understanding of it, um, obviously you just touched on so much of it, um, but that all elements are speaking to each other um, and they're all in communication and are in a growth process with each other. Um, so that's 
you know, the humans who are cultivating the microbes in the soil, the food that's the, the food that's growing, the herbs that are growing, um, the you know the animals that are participating in fertilizing the soil, and then um, the benefits that humans receive from that process. Mm -hmm. And that brings us back that, that system theory, it's also the foundation of the permaculture concept. So this concept uh, was uh, found in the uh, late 70s uh, with Bill Mollison in Australia and later on David Holguin. Uh, and this was a reaction to the um, a situation of, of the planet. You know, at the 70s, there was already the Green Revolution, there was a lot of, of uh, conventional agriculture, uh, a lot of chemicals, uh, and all the environmental violence that uh, it's still present and now it's like even worse. So mm. the idea was to create productive systems that have the diversity, the stability, and the resiliency of natural ecosystems. So basically the idea was to create systems that works as nature does. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why, at least for me, one of the way, best ways of explaining permaculture and something that I've seen that works uh, pretty uh, well, is just analyzing the word itself, permaculture, that is like permanent culture. And just by understanding permanent and culture, these two words opens like a whole uh, discussion. First, permanent. Uh, so maybe in the 70s, um, the, um, the word sustainable was not a trendy word. So permanent was talking about basically sustainability. Uh, and then culture, it's, we know that it's like all these abstract um, concept that uh, brings together ideologies, cosmologies, world wilds, uh, territories, traditions, practices. So it's a complexity that is where humans interact. So permaculture basically is saying that we, there's a way that we can con uh, build the cultures that are sustainable. And the only way of doing that is by biomimicry, so doing what nature does, because nature is the master. Uh, a forest is the perfect example of sustainability. Um, we, the forest doesn't need any kind of watering, doesn't need any kind of uh, chemical pesticides, because it's able to provide everything by not just the forest itself, but all the elements that are part of the forest. Uh, so that uh, perfection is what um, permaculture tries to mimic. But of course, that the only way of creating, of creating culture, of building culture is by agriculture, by producing food, because we cannot uh, build any kind of um, pyramids with our empty stomach. We cannot write new music, new poems, uh, create more knowledge if we don't have our basic needs covered. And the most basic need is food. And nowadays, uh, that is not a necessity that it's uh, being fulfilled by the system. Uh, Guatemala was, has one of the worst uh, children undernourishment index in Latin America. Well, it has the worst in Latin America. Uh, and how countries as Guatemala, that has this perfect climate, that has all this biodiversity, uh, how is possible that having that gift of, from nature, uh, still there's people that don't have access to food. And of course that that happens because how we are understanding uh, agriculture and food production as uh, right now. So, how we are understanding agriculture, uh, it's an heritage uh, mostly from World War II and also from the Industrial Revolution, where the idea was there's no enough food, so we need to produce more food, faster, bigger, and with less work. 
So nowadays we rely only in around five crops. Uh, that is corn, uh, beans, rice, soy, and well, here in Guatemala, it depends. Uh, but basically, we can find corn everywhere. Uh, corn syrup, uh, even in Coke, you can find corn now instead of, of sugar cane. Um, so we are relying in this way of producing food that is centralized and it doesn't um, respect uh, the ecosystem. So, oh yeah, this is the ultimate seed. We are going to grow corn, uh, the bigger and the, and the faster every, in every time. So this is the seed and the same seed is going to be all over the world. Um, we are using airplanes to uh, throw all the pesticides and all the herbicides. Uh, so this way of understanding agriculture and food production, it's based in the capitalistic uh, framework that is uh, the hegemonic ideology right, uh, right now. Uh, and most of these have an economic interest after World War II, because all the investment that was made in uh, weapons development, in, in all these bioweapons as well, um, uh, cars, tanks, planes, uh, all that investment was no longer useful because war was over. And there's like many uh, international treatments that forbid uh, many of these weapons. So they changed uh, all the um, uh, activities or they change the results of their findings to be able to apply it uh, in, for example, agriculture. So all the pesticides or the herbicides that are provoking cancer nowadays, it's a product of the biological, uh, bio, uh, biological warfare that was happening during World War II. The tractors, the planes, all of that comes from the uh, building of uh, tanks, and, and worksheets. So this way of understanding food production became a, the term or the topic known as food security. So it's like, we are going to make a lot of food to make it available to people. So we are going to keep the food. The agriculture business is going to provide for everyone. And this, I think that it really got it. It's, I, we cannot lie, they are producing a lot of food, but at the same time, the distribution of food is not fair. We can see in supermarket how the amount of food that is being uh, wasted in, in everywhere, in, we're going to see a lot of food being wasted. So it's not, pro, it's not a problem about of production, but it's a problem about distribution. And this comes hand to hand with uh, the economical system. So this created a reaction from the um, communities and from the uh, gra uh, grassroots uh, movements. And they started to talk about food sovereignty. So the ultimate goal is not having available food. The ultimate goal is that every community can self-determinate what is going to eat, how is going to eat it, uh, when is going to eat it, how is going to plant it. So this is the huge difference about food security and food sovereignty. And there's many examples of how uh, we can reach a uh, food sovereignty. But one uh, one of the best um, uh, ways of understanding that is that we must eat what nature provides. And each, each, ecosystem, uh, each ecosystem has different uh, products. And we can see that when we see the, the, the maps uh, that shows the origin of crops. And that's when comes all the native uh, species and all the native crops. And the tropics, also known, some part of the tropics are hotspots that because they 
um, concentrate most of the uh, biodiversity. Uh, they have, it's incredible the amount of food that the tropics have. And here in Mesoamerica, for example, uh, there's corn, uh, squash, beans, peppers, avocado, some kinds of palms. It's in the fruits, it's like, it's infinite, the, the food that we can eat. And this is happening. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to talk about that uh, okay, uh, in, in a while. Okay, so, good. <laughs> so yeah, the thing is that our food systems should take this information into account. It's like, what is the best crop to, to grow in this specific ecosystem? And I understand this as two uh, uh, opposite streams on, in the same spectrum. So one stream is we are going to adapt to where we live. And, and the other side of the spectrum is we are going to say, I want to eat, eat this, this, and this, and I'm going to make nature it grow what I want to want it to grow. So for me, this second extreme is how agriculture is understanding food production. Uh, it is pushing nature to do what humans want. When it should be the opposite, because we as humans are just part of the whole ecosystem, and this is creating a bunch of of uh, problems as, as you pretty sure that you know already. Um, but the thing is that we already know those problems. So how we address them, how we transform that reality. Uh, so here at the at IMAP, uh, the North American Permaculture Institute, there's uh, some strategies that we think that are pretty important. And we have um, settled the, the institution um, by these uh, main priorities. So one is education. We know that education is uh, important. And it's not just like giving the information. It's like creating dialogues to create new knowledge every day. Then we have food sovereignty. And IMAP has uh, this project that works mostly with amaranth plants and chia seeds. When we work with local uh, uh, farmers to grow organic amaranth, and then we have a processing center where we create uh, flowers, cookies, a, a tole that is a traditional drink uh, that is uh, um, drunk by most of people around here. So this project tries to transform native plants into food. Um, and I think that this also uh, involves the economic acti activity because it's like creating uh, some income, not just for farmers, but the ones are processing uh, these products, the ones are uh, giving or like uh, selling uh, the products. So it's part of the whole sovereignty chain. It's not just only about food sovereignty, but it's also creating resilient communities. And the other important action that IMAP is doing is the, the one that I have here. So the seed bank. So seeds are one of the most important um, pillars, pillars of uh, food sovereignty, because that way we don't need to be um, buying seeds every time that we want to grow them, as opposite as hybrids or, or, or GMOs. So farmers need to go every, every high planting season to the, the, to the shops and get the seeds. And, in, and even there are some suits uh, or some uh, low issues when the farmer is producing its own seed. So in response to this, we have the heirloom seeds. So the heirloom seeds are open pollination. And what they do is that they can be reproduced in, in, in the plots. It's pretty easy. You just need to plant them and then you're going to get your new, new seed. The thing is that this is this has been like a tradition. And we know that indigenous and ancestral knowledge 
uh, is being affected by how Western society is just understanding reality. And we can start understanding this issue of losing our heritage, our native heritage, just with seeds. Nowadays, it's hard to find uh, some species. <coughs> Sorry. So yeah, it's hard to find some species uh, that, what, like 60, 70 years ago, they were growing wild. So the IMAP Seed Bank tries to um, give that, <coughs> <clears throat> try to give uh, that uh, those seeds uh, and make them available not just to farmer but to anyone that wants to grow uh, native plants and and also Creole heirloom seeds um, and this is pretty important because this is like the right beginning of of any kind of farming uh, activity uh, there's a lot of uh, political uh, struggles around this here in Guatemala, uh, the Guatemalan government was pushed by the U.S. government to approve uh, a law that um, all of the seeds, all of the crops um, in, Guatemala, in Guatemala must be certified or grown by certified seed. What does that mean? Hybrids or uh, organic certifications that are pretty expensive and needs a lot of the technical details where the small farmers from the local villages, of course, that are not able to, to fulfill. Uh, so yeah, we can talk a lot about seeds. It's one of the um, main activities uh, at IMAP's uh, uh, Permaculture Center, uh, not just um, producing seed, but also raising the awareness about the, the problem that it has. One of the things that also uh, COVID uh, and the pandemic showed to us is the importance of thinking about the interactions and, and, and not just one um, element or just one uh, direct action reaction kind of way of thinking or understanding things. So we uh, tried to make many activities during the pandemic. Uh, and there were three main activities that we did. One was giving uh, like food baskets, like right? as many uh, things that people can eat. And we gave these baskets to producers that are, farm, uh, that are part of our networks and not just for the food sovereignty program, but also for the seed bank or the seed producers. So we gave uh, a lot of, of uh, baskets with full of food, but all the food that we um, gave in these um, uh, baskets uh, was produced by local producers. So first we were ensurance that people was, were receiving healthy food without any kind of pesticides or, or G, uh, GMO um, product. But second, we were giving money, like actual money to farmers, you know? So instead of going to the big companies and giving the money to them, we were like, okay, so, and it was not a donation. It was just a service, you know, the economic uh, activity that even capitalists, capitalists talk about. Uh, so it was not just giving the food to the people, but also giving the same money to maybe the ones that sold the product, some of them also receive those baskets. So that's the idea to, to create that sense of community and interconnection. We cannot go to even to other municipalities to work in emergency times. IMAP doesn't have the resources to do that. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to focus on the local. And of course, that we are thinking globally. That's why we think in these economical interactions and all of that. But the idea is to have a direct impact uh, as close as we are and as close as our resources allow that. Maybe if IMAP have like the double of the staff, 
and the dollar of resources, maybe we could be working like this uh, way with two or three municipalities, but that's not the case. So the idea is to use those resources to really have an impact on when it's going to be an impact work where it counts, uh, the books uh, said. The second action that IMAP did uh, was uh, cr the creation of food gardens. Uh, and this was pretty curious for me, uh, pretty interesting for me, because while I was looking for funding, uh, many of the um, uh, institutions or agencies that I uh, talked with, they were like, oh yeah, we could give money, but the thing is that you are just going to do five food gardens and we need like a bigger impact. We need like 20 or 25 or 50 food gardens. So we cannot give you that money, that amount of money, if you just want to work with five or six families. And the thing that I told them, okay, if we really want to insurance at least a 50% of the family intake, we need first some a good uh, piece of land and second, uh, an intensive work there. So we need to give a lot of compost. We need to work with a lot of uh, navy plants. And that's not just that, I'm going to give you a, a pretty box with some tomatoes and a couple of lettuce and for 100 families. And no, that's not the idea. The idea is to really have an impact. So a couple of institutions believe in that strategy. So we were able to create like, like truly full uh, food, uh, food gardens with watering systems, uh, with a huge biodiversity. The species selection was main thinking, not even selling the product, but their families consuming not just food, but also medicinal plants. So this food garden project was pretty uh, interesting to me uh, because I think that we were thinking in long term. And in that moment during the pandemic, most of institutions were thinking in long term. That is good. People needed food. People needed food baskets. But if we keep with this short term uh, perspective, the next pandemic is going to happen the same. So we need to think in those permanency uh, or long term uh, scale. Then the third uh, project or the three, third action that we did during the pandemic is that we offer big subsidies to the Amaran products to institutions and groups that were giving food to the community. Because the idea was, hey, don't use Incaparina, that is an industrial atole that is pretty um, consumed here in the region because it's cheap but it's made out of GMO corn and GMO soy, and is owned by one of the richest families in Guatemala. So we don't believe in that corn. So we subsidize the half of the price of our toll to make it cheaper than that, that industrial. And we know that when we talk about uh, food production, the, the more you produce, the cheaper the product is. So we were trying to not compete, but be at the, at, at the same level than uh, these big industries when we have only uh, 90 producers that have less than an acre, uh, one of them. So we were like really trying to push the limits and so in order to be uh, make available or accessible this super nutritious at all during uh, the pandemic time. So, this is how we think that we are promoting One Health through permaculture. Uh, that is not just about farming, it's about thinking about the whole system. Uh, as I was telling to you, economic, politics, uh, history, or any kind of science. So that's the idea. Um, and yeah, and basically that's it. I, I don't want to keep uh, just talking and talking and throwing information. Uh, I think that there's a lot to talk about these uh, different topics, but, but yeah, I think that that's it for today. Uh, so yeah, I would like to hear like a little bit of feedback, maybe um, about the people. Okay, so around the lake, uh, mostly is an indigenous community and also is rural community. Um, 
And the social dynamic between the Ladino or the Creole population and the indigenous communities, and not just in Guatemala, I think that this is happening all over the world. There's a lot of discrimination, exclusion, exclusion. So this creates a big gap in the distribution of resources. So as I was telling you that Guatemala has the worst uh, uh, undernourishment uh, index, at the same time, Guatemala has the best macroeconomic index in the region. So that is telling us about the disparity of uh, resource distribution. Um, and when it's about indigenous communities, this comes even worse because of the ras racism that is uh, here nowadays. So the around the lake, around the lake, it's mostly indigenous communities, rural communities that are uh, um, uh, that their main income source are the the like the micro agro activity. Uh, most of them also work in big farms of, of, of a monoculture. Here in, here in San Lucas, the 80% of land is being used uh, to coffee production. Uh, so we cannot eat coffee, you know? And most of that, the high quality um, coffee production are, are for exports. Uh, and of course that the money is not being uh, delivered to the small producer. It's being delivered to the one that is selling outside uh, the, 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 the coffee. So that's the reality more or less uh, around the lake. Uh, rural, indigenous, a lot of exclusion uh, and mostly farming uh, activity. I don't know if that answers your question or if you, uh, you would like to hear a little bit more of that. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Christian. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will depend on the project. And also it will depend on uh, the amount of time that the students uh, are here. Um, also we have our internship program uh, that is not just for IPSL or NUNM. It's like for everyone that is have a, like a connection with, uh, with EMAP. So during our internship program, uh, or, uh, we try to match the interest of the students with uh, the needs and activities of the institute. So many times uh, in the feedback, for example, the, the, the work will be something as creating um, um, some documents around the seed. Oh, there's, here there's around 60 priorities of, of plants. So a project will be grab uh, five species and write about how do you grow it? What's the best weather? Or you could also help in marketing. Uh, it will depend. It will depend because we try to um, yeah, customize uh, every uh, specific uh, uh, project that is around here. Christian, can you talk about kind of the structure of the One Health course that it's, it's pretty unique. It's outside of the classroom a lot. It's traveling um, and sort of the main idea behind the way you created the class. Mm -hmm. So food, the, the, this uh, one health class has, for me, has three main um, like parts. One is understanding the whole historical social politics reality, uh, not just in Guatemala, but in terms of uh, geopolitics with a Guatemalan perspective. So the idea is understanding how Guatemala have been uh, interacting in this uh, global uh, uh, system. And, and that's mostly the first part of the, of the class, uh, talking about history, the Mesoamerican uh, politics, um, some uh, contemporary indexes uh, about reality. Then uh, once we get those uh, background, we go uh, towards, uh, we go, or we explore some basic concepts on permaculture, on one health, on system thinking, uh, complex thinking, and, and some other uh, themes around those. Uh, and then the last part, it's 
going to, to, to communities, going to different institutions, organizations to, to know, to learn how, even though they don't, they don't know these concepts, they are applying them and they are using them. So we learn from experience uh, all these concepts. We see how these concepts are uh, affecting contemporary reality here in the lake. And of course, this comes with uh, some uh, field trips that we go to the, the different towns around the lake. Uh, we know uh, many people that is doing amazing works. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that it's uh, pretty a, a well mixed between dialogues, lectures, and field trips. Uh, yeah, um, students were uh, live uh, here at the Permaculture Center. We are about uh, three and a half mile away from town. So it's uh, at the shore of the lake. Uh, we have uh, some food gardens. We have um, ecological uh, showers, ecological bathrooms. Um, and yeah, the idea is to also cook here together. So there's a shared kitchen when we get uh, many of the mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so so yeah that's the, that's the idea that's uh, where we are and the students uh, live here uh, the application of culinary arts we have a specific workshop on on food processing so um, the ones that are working uh, here in the processing centers that are creating not just the products, but also the kind of the gathering uh, project uh, that uh, is being delivered when groups come. So they are the ones that are teaching um, uh, traditional recipes, uh, how to use native plants. And, and I love cooking is one of my favorite things around. Uh, I love also fermentation. So I always that there's a student here. Uh, we cook together. I share some of the recipes that I know. Uh, we, do, uh, we do ferments. Uh, and yeah, so I think if that you are into cooking, uh, I think that you're going to love this place. <laughs> Christian, how about the um, touching a little bit about on the Mayan cosmology course? Mm. So as I was telling you here at IMAP, we try to integrate the cultural aspect in the permaculture concept. So Mesoamerica uh, is the house of the Mayan culture, is where the ecosystem of the Mayan culture. So of course that we try to integrate, not just in the Mayan cosmology class, but also in the One Health class, uh, in our permaculture uh, classes and, and every aspect. But Mayan cosmology class, it focused on the application of this cosmology into health systems. So many uh, spiritual guides uh, are part of this class where they teach first the foundations of Mayan cosmology. We talk about calendars, we talk about uh, the, the nature energies, we have a fire ceremony, uh, and later on we discuss the Mayan uh, health system, when there's like midwives, uh, herbalists, um, uh, bone healers, they're like, there's like a huge uh, uh, universe in the Mayan uh, cosmology. So we also go uh, to know uh, people that are actually working with this. And then we also uh, uh, talk with a conventional um, or maybe the, the national a health system to see how they are integrating the cultural aspect in the mm -hmm. hospital or in the health center and, and, and all of this. Uh, the Mayan cosmology, we address a little bit of that. Uh, if we are running the Mayan cosmology and the One Health class, of course, that you are welcome to, to come into the lectures. Uh, but if we are just doing the One Health class, um, we're going to get a little bit of, the, of that, but, but yeah, with the Mayan cosmology, that's like the main um, um, topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two separate courses. 
You don't so, need to choose. You don't need to choose. <laughs> you, you, can, you can come here for three months and yeah. I'm pretty sure you're going to have a, an amazing time. Yeah. Actually, the, the um, course right now with One Health is taught as an intensive. So it's taught over a shorter period of time. Um, I don't know, 10 days or so, Christian, you, you'll yeah, need sometimes days. change it up a bit. Um, but right now we have a, a grad student with the IPSL program. She's staying, you know, about three months, but she's doing, um, she's actually doing three classes and my in cosmology and, and one health. And then what we call um, our COSA course, community organizing social activism, which has a particular, you've, you've given it a particular theme around health. Christian, the, the COSA course. Yeah, not just only about health, um, but the main local struggles. So we are talking about women's rights, we are talking about environmental advocacy, we are talking about indigenous rights, uh, and of course, of course, the impact uh, of COVID into this mm -hmm. activism. Excellent, that's cool. And they're also, just so you know, the breadth of um, the types of things you can experience in Guatemala, but also, these, these do occur in other of our program locations, but right now one, Stacy, the grad student that I'm speaking of, um, she's also, and maybe Alexis too, uh, she's, yeah. they're, they're contributing to a, um, a research a project. Research project, yeah. It, it'd be cool to learn a little bit about that. Alexis, by the way, is um, an NUNM nutrition student. No, global health student. Yeah, global health. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the research a little bit. So the idea is to interview some activists that are working around the lake uh, to first understand their work before COVID, then how was the, the work during COVID, and then how do, how do they understand or how do they imagine that the, the work will be once the, the pandemic is over. So that's the, the main theme. Uh, so it's kind of the new priorities in social justice or in social activism in the Lake Atitlan after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And how, how far along are you in the-, the we, are about, we are about to finish with the interviews. We are getting amazing information. It's, it, yeah, we're about to get uh, there. I, we're, we're definitely sharing that with you. That's cool. Are they, yeah, are, did you guys record them? Did you record yeah. them? Yeah, we have the, the audio of them. Fantastic, yeah. And just so you guys know, this was, um, this was run through um, IPSL's IRB, which is a review board. Um, it doesn't, it wasn't, it's social behavioral research, so it's not like it's a clinical research in any way, but um, it was, it was good to, do that exercise through the review board because what that means then for Christian in EMAP and also the students and also the organ the activists all of them can take that data and that information and utilize it in ways that benefits them so for instance it, it becomes publishable it becomes uh, um, something that Stacy could use in her culminating project. It could become something that EMAP utilizes to write grants and the social activist uses it to create more um, awareness of their work. I don't know, it's just, it's very broad, but it becomes usable in that way. Yeah, you know, it also, and it's also creating networks because yeah. now we have been, first we are, I, I'm meeting persons that I haven't met before. And second, I'm looking at the connections. So one, one of the things that maybe won't be part of the research project, but one of the things that I will be doing is like, hey, you and you talk, talk about pretty much the same stuff. So you should talk. So that's yeah. why I'm trying to do, create that network as well. Yeah, that's beneficial to everyone. That's really cool. Does anybody else have any questions? I don't want to dominate. Um, are we able to have your email address? <laughs> if we do have any questions Absolutely. or would like to chat with you? Oh yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Sure. 
And Michaela, part of the, um, if you decide to, to participate coming up in summer, right? Yeah, it's summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, part of the preparation is to get you in touch with Christian and everybody, I try to convene a meeting with all of the participants with their respective program directors before they go. So that that will definitely be part of it. But yes, you could. Uh, oh, amazing. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will be sharing with you the, the PowerPoint. There are just mostly pictures and random words. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that you kind of remind what I was talking about. Yeah. And I have to say that the Permaculture Center is at one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen on the lake. And it just being there was one of those really soothing kind of um, opportunities where you could just really it just really kind of opens your mind to a different way of living and being in the world, which is really nice. Mm. Um, especially from us coming from the, the hubbub, you know, and then yeah. coming down to a peaceful place. Um, it really, it really does affect you. So um, I hope you guys can join us. There's a lot, a lot to offer as you can, as you know, from what Christian was talking about. Yeah, this has been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for taking the time of, of being here, and I hope that you enjoyed uh, uh, this. It's not a dialogue. I'm sorry that it was not a dialogue, but yeah, it's just me like talking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we, we like the stuff. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I will follow up with um, Christian's email. You could also email me, and um, yeah, we'll just keep the conversation going. And remember that it's all customized, so. As, ta as um, Christian was saying, we create the program based upon the, um, you know, the, the interests of, of you guys. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much, Christian. We'll talk later. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Okay. See you.